So welcome back, everyone. Uh, I think we're still missing a couple. Um, and this is day two. It's the last day of the course. Um, and I wanted to sort of maybe just briefly cover what we talked about yesterday and then also highlight some of the things we're going to try and do today that's perhaps a little different. So yesterday we learned about the basics of machine learning. And then we took kind of a deep dive for a good part of the day into learning um, the details of how machine learning methods work, what the code looks like for things like decision trees and artificial neural networks. Uh, we talked about some of the math. Uh, we talked about some of the um, parameters that you can control. We talked about the workflow that's needed and how um, the, the six step process that we outlined for developing uh, software and testing it uh, was something we followed in, in all of the examples. I call it looking under the hood. Um, and this is you know, trying to understand the mechanics of a car engine, for instance. And obviously to drive a car, you don't need to know everything about how and why a car works. So for today, we're gonna explore a bit more under the hood for a brief amount of time, but then we're gonna basically show you how you can do some of the stuff, some of the difficult stuff more easily um, using things like um, Keras and Scikit-learn and um, other tools um, that allow you to, to do fairly sophisticated machine learning methods um, and to develop the code much more quickly. Um, one of the other things that we also wanna do uh, today is we'll, we'll talk about uh, large language models and how that's changing both bioinformatics but also people's access to machine learning. The other thing I, I wanted to emphasize today, and just as maybe a reminder or highlighting what, what's happened in past machine learning courses that we've taught, and it, it sometimes depends on the dynamic of the group. But um, all of you, you know, are attending the course because you have some interest in machine learning, but some of you also have some specific um, applications of machine learning that you want to do um, in, in your own work. And because this course is sort of an introductory course, um, we're not likely to have an example of a problem that you're wanting to solve or an exact bit of code that will address your specific needs. But our, our two TAs have worked in machine learning for a long time. And while I'm lecturing, um, they're obviously looking at Slack. Um, and this is probably a good time for some of you to start asking either during Slack time or during uh, my lectures or during the breaks um, to ask about your own work and some advice about how uh, machine learning could help your particular problems or your particular interest. You can also ask, you know, during the class, um, although it might be, you know, trying to do it when it aligns or when I happen to be talking about that topic. But um, as I said, in past machine learning workshops, um, we had a lot of students asking about their own work and how some of the things we've talked about here could apply to their own work. And so I'd really like you guys to, to consider that or encourage you to ask those types of questions. Uh, now that you've got a little bit um, more of an idea about machine learning, um, hopefully then your questions might be a little more targeted or specific. So that was what I wanted to start off with. Um, and as I say, to encourage you guys to, to ask questions, um, both during the lecture or through Slack uh, while I'm speaking. All right, uh, we'll get underway. Um, this is the usual set of slides telling you what we're uh, allowing in terms of Creative Com Commons license. And now we're on module five. And today we're gonna be focusing on gene finding. And the reason why I want to bring this one up is, A, it's related probably more to what some of the things that most of you as students are interested in. Um, it also addresses um, the essential concept of feature finding 
and kind of takes you through, I think, a more realistic process on how um, machine learning software is developed. And, and what I'm going to try and highlight is that typically you take on a problem, you try it with uh, an initial design, and more often than not, it doesn't work. It doesn't work as well as you expected. Yesterday, we had examples of machine learning where the programs performed quite well, in some cases, almost perfectly. Um, today, we're going to show you how um, an initial draft of the program or programs does absolutely terribly, and then how you can use things like feature selection or smarter tools or concepts to gradually boost the performance of your program to a point where it's acceptable. And this is sort of a more realistic process for machine learning. Uh, you almost never can write a program and the results are near perfect and then you publish a paper on it. It just doesn't work. Typically, you'll spend um, weeks to months uh, in developing machine learning tools if you're working from scratch. Now, the other point is that if you can find a tool that someone else has already written that does something that's very, very close to what you want to do, then, then you don't have to do any coding. But you could or should be able to, hopefully, now, you know, about Colab and more about Python programming or other tools, you could be able to download that, install it, run it, and maybe have at least a, a, an inkling of what parts of the code you need to change to suit your specific problem. But if you're doing something from scratch, which is what we're sort of simulating here, uh, it, it takes months, um, not just for coding, but also for testing, refining, and improving. OK. So this is an outline for today's schedule. We might modify the schedule a little later on. Uh, in particular, module seven is probably going to be quite short. And so we might shift things up about 15 minutes. And module eight is going to be longer than what's shown here. So I don't know, Nia, maybe we'll try and make that time adjustment um, as we come to it. Sure, yeah. Um, so today we're going to be talking about gene prediction. Uh, this time we're focusing on prokaryotic genes. Uh, if we wanted to do eukaryotic genes, uh, this lecture would probably occupy the entire day. Um, so most of you probably are aware about how gene structures are, are in bacteria, uh, microbes. And we're going to explain some of the methods that can be used or, uh, to find open reading frames. Uh, we're talking a little bit about how gene uh, identification is assessed. Um, and then, of course, we'll look at the code that we developed and sort of the iterations that we have um, to predict prokaryotic genes. And of course, we'll be using Colab um, to get that code running. So I think everyone knows about the genetic code, um, a lot of the concepts of codons and, and uh, translation from DNA to protein, um, as well as transcription uh, from DNA to RNA, uh, were developed in the 1960s. Um, and the genetic code is displayed in this table here, where you can see that different codons, uh, triplets of bases, code for different amino acids. Um, there are start codons, that's the AUG or ATG from methionine. And then there's three stop codons, uh, TAA, TAG, TGA, or uridine, which is what RNA uses. And then you can see that there's you know, different triples that are used for coding different amino acids. Um, some amino acids are only have a single codon, like tryptophan. Uh, others, like cysteine and tyrosine just have two. And then there's others that are much more common. Um, leucine has six, um, isoleucine and valine four, glycine four, arginine curiously has six. Um, the frequency of codons is actually generally reflective of the frequency 
of amino acids in proteins. So tryptophan is a rare amino acid, methionine is a rare amino acid, cysteine and tyrosine are relatively rare. Leucine is a very abundant amino acid, uh, as is glycine. Uh, the exception to the rule is arginine, and arginine uh, may have a number of different roles. It's obviously used as a signaling amino acid in our bodies. It um, seems to be an ancient amino acid, which was largely replaced by lysine. Uh, but the persistence of arginine in the number of codons probably also has to do with um, some control over um, transcription and even translation rates. Um, so that's the genetic code. It's also important to remember the genetic code is not completely frozen. There are multiple um, uh, alternate start codons and there are even in some cases alternate stop codons. Um, again, this is review for everyone, but um, when we talk about translating DNA, we have to remember that DNA is two strands, not a single strand. And so um, the forward strand that starts with ATG in black, uh, and the reverse strand, um, which is in darker blue below that. When we translate, we go in codons, and then we use that table that I just showed. So ATG um, in frame one is methionine, CGT, arginine. Um, it's like we're slightly off in terms of our um, positioning, but um, CGT is arginine, ATA is isoleucine. We can go up in terms of um, shifting over by one codon or one base, since that's frame one, frame two, frame three, where I have a star that indicates um, a stop codon. So we're leading, reading from left to right in the top forward strand, and then for the um, bottom strand, the reverse strand or complement strand, we read from right to left. And so we would see AAT as a codon, GCG as a codon, and go this way. So any given sequence of DNA potentially can give you up to six different um, reading frames in terms of translation. Uh, that's important when you're doing gene finding because you can find genes both in the forward and in the complementary strand or reverse strand. Again, this should also be relatively um, well known with the group. This is just a reminder about prokaryotic gene structure. So we call most prokaryotic genes or bacterial genes open reading frames or ORFs. They always have a start codon. They always have an end codon or stop codon. And those are considered all of them part of the gene. So the genes in prokaryotes are not broken up into exons like they are in eukaryotes. Um, so that makes gene finding somewhat easier. And um, the frame is usually defined by the start codon, although you can also find um, genes within genes in bacteria, although that's rare. Then there is a set of uh, sequences upstream of most bacterial genes or ORFs or even operons. Um, and those are important for both um, RNA polymerase binding, um, also for uh, ribosomal binding, because the RNA transcript is also uh, needs to have an RNA site. Um, and one of the more universal signals is called the TATA box. Now, when you scan forward, uh, or when you're doing gene finding, you, you, you take your forward strand um, and you'll take that and look beginning um, at the beginning, you know, base one, if you've got a genome sequence, and start scanning forward until you find an ATG or stop, start codon. Once you're in that, you can stay in the same reading frame and scan in groups of three until you find a stop codon. Um, typically, you might use um, a cutoff. Um, of maybe about 50 codons um, rather than 50 bases. And if you've got something that's you know more than 50, uh, could be hundreds, then uh, you've got a gene identified or an open reading frame. 
Then you can go back to the, the beginning, which is where you found your start code on, and then you can shift over um, by um, potentially one base, um, and then start scanning to see if you can find some other start codons. And that might allow you to find some nested genes. Um, and the process is repeated uh, until you covered the entire length of the forward strand, and then you look at the reverse or reverse complement um, to look at the reverse strand or complement strand. So you have to do two passes to do gene finding, one for the forward strand, one for the complement or um, reverse strand. And that's just the nature of, of gene finding. Now there's lots of gene finding programs. Um, one of the very first uh, servers that was built at NCBI, which hosts GenBank and many other tools, um, was this thing called ORF Finder. And you can upload any number or any length of prokaryotic genetic data, run it through ORF Finder, and it will produce the six um, translation or six reading frame translation of all of these ORFs. So you can see um, in this graph that's highlighted near the top, um, you can see orange bars, and there should be six of them in any case. And you can see that uh, some of them, obviously they don't overlap, some um, within a different reading frame um, do overlap with existing genes. You can see the arrows going left to right for the first three um, rows, and then for the bottom, um, three rows from rows four, five, and six, you see um, arrows typically pointing in the other direction. Um, the output for the code, or at least for the program, allows you to click on a single ORF. We clicked on ORF 16, which is a fairly long one. You can see the translation. It indicates where the start and the stop codons are. It indicates the length in bases and the length in amino acids. Um, so this is how an ORF and or gene finding program would, would look. And it, this is roughly the density of genes that you would see uh, in a bacterial genome. Um, and again, this is just sort of background for everyone. Now, when we do gene prediction, whether it's eukaryotic or prokaryotic, there are certain protocols about how we evaluate or assess their performance. So what's shown above in the diagram is, say, the light blue is where the actual open reading frames are or where the genes are. And in red is where we've identified using some program. And um, this is an example of a not a very good gene predictor, but what we're seeing here is the prediction creates or suggests a much longer gene than is actually there for the first one, and then it predicts a much shorter gene than what's actually there. And we can find where there's you know, perfect matches between the bases, and those are called true positives, so the blue and red match. But if the red overextends the gene, those are called false positives. And there's intergenic regions. Those are called true negatives for our purposes. And then if we've underpredicted, then we have a section of false negatives. And this is at the, the base level or nucleotide level. Um, we could also score things by, you know, say at the gene or intergenic level, and you know, are we exactly right? And in both cases, we're not. And so at the gene level, we'd be doing terribly. At the base level or nucleotide level, we're, we'd be doing modestly well, maybe 60% correct. We have terms, we've talked about some of these before, sensitivity and specificity. We brought that up in terms of measurements of categories. We talked about that with confusion matrix. You can have a confusion matrix with gene prediction. There's also tools or calculations for precision and correlation. Uh, won't really go into that too much. So the, the formulas that are used for sensitivity and specificity um, are, are here. We showed that previously with the confusion matrix, but it's the same thing with gene prediction evaluation. And then there's this other formula for, for precision. 
so um, this is reiterating a little bit of what the code or concept might be for finding codons and coding regions or open reading frames. So the diagram that I showed earlier, which had an ATG at the start and a TGA at the end, you can think of um, the other codons in between as, as coding for amino acids. Now, the stop codons are canonical. We've talked about TAA, TGA, TAG, or using U. ATG is also a universal start codon, but there are in bacteria uh, several others. Uh, GTG and TTG are sort of secondary start codons. And we'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, the other point, again, to highlight was the algorithm. But typically, you don't want to consider every little short segment of start and stop codons as being a gene. It's a minimum length that ORFs typically are. The smallest one, I think, is like 17 codons. Um, might be smaller ones that people know of, but it's just they're usually all um, more than 40 or 50. This is um, algorithmically how a lot of um, ORF finders work. Um, I gave you a, a, a sort of a simplified outline, but this is um, showing an animation where you're moving in groups of three over the entire length and where you're identifying both start and stop codons based on those six uh, or three starts, three stops. And what this one is doing, it's a little more efficient, is it's finding uh, indices or positions of all the start and stop. And then you can use just the start stop values to identify valid start and stop for pairs to produce an open reading frame. So you can have a, a, um, you know, a stop at four, but is preceding the start. So obviously that doesn't make sense. Um, <clears throat> but um, looking at, uh, you know, maybe going from seven as a start to 24 as a stop is a potential or more viable uh, open reading frame. So that simple-minded one where you're just going through the entire genome length, um, forward strand and reverse strand will produce lots and lots of ORFs, but it'll also produce false positives. And so this is one where if we just ran this simple ORF finder using some constraints about the minimum ORF length through the first um, 10,000 bases in E. coli, roughly, um, is you would see a um, correct start of a gene from 337 to 2799. But then you'd see another gene internally of 567 to 780, another gene internally at 798 to 915. Then you'd see a correct one that would go at 2801, which is after 2799, uh, to 3733, and that was correct. Uh, if you looked at the reverse complement within the same segment, you'd see a lot of false positive um, genes. And so this is how a very naive open reading frame finder would, would produce lots of real data, but lots of uh, incorrect data, which would be confusing and relatively useless for genomics work. So using that simple algorithm, um, we'll, we'll implement an ORF finder. Um, and there's many ways, as I say, to write one, uh, different algorithms. We'll even see a, an example of how you can use ChatGPT to write an ORF finder. So in this case, you can find the OR finder. Um, it's in the Python code. It's probably, I think we may have R code. It's in today's module, uh, module five. You can open up the OR finder, Python tool, uh, and, and open up it in Colab. And, and this is the general outline. Um, as with most of the software that we've got in this course, we have you know, something where you read the data and then you verify the data to check for missing or incorrect data. Um, then we have to have a, a codons function, which will create that list of start and stop points, similar to that um, little animated GIF that we had. Um, 
And it'll do this in identifying the start and stop codons in all three reading frames. And then you pair uh, those start and stops in the same reading frames, because you can't have a stop codon in reading frame two paired up with a start codon in reading frame one. Uh, we're going to use a minimum length rather than a 40 codons. We're going to use a minimum length of 40 bases, um, just to make it a little more painful uh, in terms of how much uh, data is being processed. Um, and uh, we'll also not only just identify a single stop codon, we can make identify up to three stop codons within the same reading frame. And this is partly to deal with genes where there is occasionally a read through. Um, and the or finder function will also be created and called so that we can actually calculate um, and determine the position of all the ORFs on a large genome sequence. And then we're going to calculate our number of true positives and false negatives and, in essence, correct and incorrect ORFs. So this is code everyone has seen already before. We're going to import um, NumPy and Pandas uh, for both math and for data reading or data frame reading. We're going to read in the genome sequence. Um, this is, uh, we're looking at FASTA sequence format. Um, and we have, um, in this case, carriage returns, which is sort of this backslash n that we're trying to clear out. So let's just have continuous sequence. We're also getting rid of the, the header um, that every FASTA file has, which is the, the gene identification information. Um, and we're not only reading the forward sequence, we're also reading the, the reverse complement or generating uh, the reverse complement. Um, so that's the genome sequence. So we're reading in hundreds of thousands to millions of bases. Um, we're also doing our, our usual missing value and label checking. Um, so we're looking to see if there's any missing data. Uh, we're flagging if there is, and if there isn't, we'll say there's no missing data. So this is the same code or similar code that we've used um, in the past for uh, sequence analysis. Um, the ATG is already known as a start codon for this, so we didn't, I don't think, explicitly code, but we're looking at the stop codon, so we're using three stops, TAA, TGA, and TAG, and then we're creating the two separate lists, a counter list for start codons and a counter list for stop codons. Um, and then we're going to go through three different reading frames. Um, so we've got zero, one, and two is how we're counting rather than one, two, three. Uh, and then for a given reading frame, say reading frame zero, uh, we'll look for the first codon, if it's a start, add it to the start codon list, if it's a stop, we'll add it to the stop codon list. And we'll get the sort of the positions um, of those and move along. So that's sort of the, the algorithm similar to the one that uh, I showed on the animated GIF uh, as we counted through um, the forward strand. Um, so once you've got your list of start and stop codons for the different reading frames, um, then you need to pair them off. So in reading frame one, if we found a start codon at 190, um, and then we see other stop codons at 13, 46, 61, 64, those don't make sense, 112, but the one at 253 is greater than 190. So 190, 253 are potential pairs because they're within the same reading frame. So this is what we're algorithmically doing. Um, so we've got the start and stop. We're using a minimum length. So in this case, 190 or 253 minus 190 has to be greater than 40. In this case, is it 63? So that's good enough. And that passes the minimum length. Um, and uh, we're using S underscore COD for start codon. Um, and then I think we've got STP uh, underscore COD for stop codon. Um, so these are the lists, these are the numbers that we're working on. Um, and in other cases, we're looking for the first three stop codons. And I mentioned this phenomena where sometimes there is read through and genes will pass through um, the first stop codon and, and maybe include the second. Um, so this helps us find potential genes that, that uh, do happen to have a read through process. 
And as I said, you repeat this, you repeat from another starting position, looking for another, um, in some cases, overlapping genes, or um, obviously with different reading frames. The last part to the code that you guys would see is, is the or finder function. Um, and it's, it's a function with um, four inputs, um, a a, a other lists that we've generated, the data sets, the length range information are all called. Um, and it produces the full set of ORF predictions. And these are um, also uh, identified because we have, in this case, the officially identified genome sequence data for the organism, because we have this from uh, GenBank. And it will allow us to compare our predicted ORFs with the true ORFs that were identified through actually multiple years of sequence analysis. So this will allow us to compare both uh, our predictions with the gold standard. And so that was another part to this um, function. So the input sequence we used to evaluate or that we're gonna be using to evaluate this ORF predictor is the E. coli genome sequence. So E. coli was uh, the first bacterium to be sequenced. Um, and um, anyone who's worked in a lab probably has had some experience with E. coli because it's also sort of the cloning organism of choice. Um, and it's used as essentially as a model genome. So we know that there's exactly 4,407 genes in E. coli maybe give or take one or two. And we know the exact length of the K12 genome sequence, which is 4.641 million bases. So well-studied, good reference genome. Um, the genome sequence is in um, GenBank, and you can see the uh, FASTA file. And you can see the top line is a FASTA format. Those are the 71 characters that we get rid of. And then we... Um, get rid of the carriage returns to make a, a long linear sequence to do our analysis. But FASTA typically has, I think it's 70 characters, then carriage returns all the way through. Carriage returns is they're often problematic with reading in data with computers. Um, this is the set of correct genes for the first uh, about you know, 12, 13,000 bases. I sort of highlighted this one set that starts at 337, ends at 279.89. 2801 to 3733, and then onwards. And you can see that typically ORFs don't, are not nested in E. coli. They, they are separated. Um, and you can see that there are genes within the reverse complement that also overlap the forward complement, and that's well known. So genes are read both in the forward and the reverse trend. Um, the reason why E. coli has been well characterized as it, it's not only an old organism, but I spent a fair bit of my time as a youth <laughs> doing uh, annotation on E. coli. And uh, we wrote up um, the effort back in 2005, which is why we know so much uh, through these efforts of about two dozen scientists annotating and re-annotating E. coli. So this is our, um, um, our table um, in terms of our confusion matrix, which is um, predicted genes, um, correct, actual genes, correct, um, non-genes predicted and non-genes correct um, um, in terms of actual set. So using that simple ORF, we predicted 4,282 out of the 4,407 genes which is 91% correct. But we also predicted <laughs> another 1.6 million other genes, um, which is a spectacular failure if you wanna talk about um, over predictions. And so the um, false positives, it's not exactly one, it's, it's um, you know, 0.9999, whatever. Um, so in terms of, having a, a nice uh, confusion matrix where the diagonal on 
from upper left to lower right is one and one. Um, we're almost the opposite. So as I said, if someone just sent, had a simple or finding program and ran it on, on, on genome, this is the typical result you'll get, which is, a, as I said, a spectacular failure. So if that was your first attempt, and obviously this is not machine learning, um, you might say, okay, I need to do something different. And as I said, this is sort of simulating the process where someone's coding and trying to solve a problem through coding. And so you can say, okay, I don't think um, you know, conventional programming is working too well. Can I try an artificial neural net? So uh, the problem we're now is how do I find genes in DNA? Um, and what you can do is um, do a training set, not unlike what we did with secondary structure. So recall that for secondary structure, we had sequences, protein sequences, and we had um, secondary structure like H's for helix, C's for beta uh, coils, and B's for beta strands. So we could do the same with um, some training sets where we've got genes and genomes, and we've got a gene with a sequence now with a four base um, code. And then rather than C's, H's, and B's, we use C's and N's. C is for coding, N is for non-coding. So C means a gene, N means not a gene. So we can then find a good training set that has genes marked off clearly. Um, this one, what we're choosing to do is we'll take the, the training set directly from GenBank and we can take the E. coli gene and this has told us exactly where all the genes are. And so we can parse all of these things out and get both the coding sets and the non-coding sets from the E. coli genome. Uh, again, just reminding what we taught. Um, so we have our genes, we have our gold standard, we have information about what's coding and non-coding. And so we're now going to um, you know, transform our data set and choose a model. So with DNA sequence, just like with protein sequence and with base calls and coding and non-coding, this is our one hot encoding protocol. So A is going to be 1000, C0100, so on. And then the coding status, coding will be zero, non-coding one. So that's our, if you want to call it translation or one-hot encoding to, to make it compatible with a neural net. Um, we're not going to use this null padding that we used in protein sequence. That's because we're dealing with, you know, four million four and a half million bases. So missing a few bases at the front and a few bases at the end just isn't worth it. Um, so that's just a, a caveat that I'm pointing out. And um, this is sort of a simplified version. I'm not running all four bases because we, there's no C's in this example. But as I said, all we're doing is we're taking our training set with a bunch of sequence. We have our known output of where the non-coding and coding are. And we're going to basically, just like with the protein structure, we're going to have a window of a certain number of bases, and that window is going to then be, you know, produce a flattened out vector describing uh, those bases. And we might have, it could be nine, it could be um, any number, I guess, up to 60 or 51. I think we're going to use a window of 17. And then our output is going to be a zero or a one. So that kind of defines some elements about what our um, input vector size will be, what our output vector size will be, and some of the sizes of, of the hidden nodes. So mathematically, or in terms of a weight matrix, there's our input, um, which we slide along. We have an initial starting weight matrix for layer one, and another weight matrix for layer two, and then our output. And then these intermediates are, are sort of um, you know, the results of, of the um, weighting calculations. Well, at the neural net, we'll use, you know, the thresholding or activation functions. So it could be a uh, standard logistic or sigmoid function, or it could be, depending on the outputs, um, also a, um, um, 
um, a relu function or something similar. Now we do the, the back propagation um, as before. So you do a forward propagation, get your initial result. In this case, the initial result isn't quite what we want. Um, so we back propagate and do this multiple times until finally we got at least an output that's close to what we wanted. And that's you know one batch, one um, part of the training process. Um, we try another set and we compare, and maybe in this case, it's already converged. Um, doing many batch iterations, obviously the, the weights change as we've seen. And um, after rounds, multiple rounds of training, we settle on a, an optimized weight matrix that works for all of the inputs that we provide it. Now, just like we did with um, protein sequence, um, we're using windows. Um, and uh, unlike for protein sequence where we have you know, helix coil beta strand, it's coding, non-coding. Uh, we're sort of looking at a central base um, to assign. So we have an odd number of bases that we're reading in terms of the window. And as I said, I think it was 17 that we used for this um, program. And um, what we're going to do is we'll start at the you know, base one, use the window. And so it means that if our window case was, um, what is it, 13 here, um, it would be the, the sixth or seventh base is what we would predict. And we missed the first six uh, in, our, in terms of our prediction, our first five. And we'd run to the end. But it's a sliding window process, just like what we did for protein secondary structure prediction. Um, as I said, I think for the code that you'll see with this particular algorithm, we used Windows 17. Um, but because we're encoding, one hot encoding with A's, C's, G's, and T's using 100s zero, zero, and so on, um, the total bit size will be 17 by 4, so 68. If you recall, for um, amino acids, we had 21 times 17, so that was 350 something. Um, we're doing the same thing where we slide our window of 17 and move it down. And we have obviously a new center codon that we're predicting. Um, and then we slide on the forward strand and we slide on the reverse complement. Um, we also have to you know, ensure that we are coding where the genes are. Um, so with this, um, simple algorithm was to assign ones to everything and then replace the coding ring non-coding or coding ones with zeros. So one is non-coding, zero is coding um, in this particular training set. As with other neural nets, we have a, a training and a testing set. And so we've set 70% of the E. coli gene as training, 30% um, will be um, the testing set. So just as we're, even though we're training on one organism, we're just sort of cutting out um, the last third of the E. coli genome. So we're not seeing that last third of the genome. We are characterizing the first two thirds. So we're still sticking to the rule that the, the testing set is, has to be something that you don't use in training. Um, so by parsing out roughly two thirds of the genome for, for training, we're ensuring that we still have at least one third uh, for testing. So this is what our input vector is. It's gonna be 3.2 million rows with um, windows of 68 bases um, going all the way through it. So it's a, it's a big data matrix. It's a huge amount of data that we have to read. Um, but that's, that's the outline. And hopefully you guys can see the similarity between what we're doing for gene finding with this ANN and what we did yesterday for protein secondary structure. So if we had the program and we wanted to encode this, we could you know obviously go to Google Colab. I think everyone 
It's done this now. Open your note, new, new notebook. Start coding by introducing um, the name um, gene finding or gene searching for ANN. That's why we call it GSAN. So for this one, if you go to the code that we've provided with you, provided to you, uh, we're going to be using NumPy and Pandas, but we're also using Seaborn and Matplotlib to help with some of the, the data visualization. Um, that's not so essential to the coding that we're doing. So for the first 3 million or so basis, we're going to import the gene position data where all the start and end codons are, and that's being read through here. Um, and we're reading things as the FASTA files. So we're clearing out some of the header data. Um, so this is the same um, coding set that we had for our simple ORF binder. Um, and as I said, most of the code that we use for the neural net component and you know, collecting derivatives, learning rates, everything else where we had to kind of slog through the math is identical to the secondary structure um, neural net. So rather than showing you all that code and explaining it all over again, we're just gonna skip that. And we're just gonna jump to the results. So um, this is the confusion matrix. And if you recall the confusion matrix for our simple ORF reader, we had, you know, um, off diagonal elements that were pretty bad. Um, but the on diagonal elements in terms of coding um, were actually pretty good. Um, we had a 0.91 or better success rate. So with this neural net where we you know, had a chance to train on the first 3 million bases and first 3,000 genes and testing on the last 1,000 genes, um, the result is actually pretty bad again. We're doing better with re regard to our false positives and false negatives, but our true positives and our true negatives aren't so good. Remember, we want to have a diagonal of one and one um, from upper left to lower right. So that's this part. And we want zero and zero in terms of those off diagonal elements. And we see that as we increase the window size, um, go from seven, nine, 17, Performance improves slightly, um, but um, we're still not seeing anything close to zero and we're still not seeing anything close to one here. So whereas the first OR finder was a total failure, this neural net for gene finding is, um, I call it a, a general failure. And this is, as I say, it's typical if you're doing um, programming and you're trying to apply some machine learning tool to something, it's not unusual to get a, a disappointing result the first or second time. So what we find, and if you look at the data uh, and the output a little more closely, um, and this is what you'll see if you were to run the program, um, is that rather than seeing large sections of non-coding and coding, and I think everyone understands that you know, genes are pretty coherent things. They, they have coding sets that stretch for hundreds or thousands of bases, and the non-coding regions also are pretty smooth. The predicted um, output actually looked more like this. So there is no continuity. We have Ns and Cs sort of flipping back and forth. So that the way we had done the encoding, the hot, one hot encoding, the way we had done um, the window sliding, the way we had um, you know, built the system, uh, we had not given it any coherence or context, and it couldn't learn the coherence and context from the training set. So it often helps to look at your output in more detail rather than just simply saying, you know, here's my confusion matrix. So this. Um, highlighted a central mistake in the coding that we had. It wasn't going to be as simple as uh, applying the secondary structure concepts to this. So um, the next step is to try and include more information. And this is all about feature 
uh, extraction or feature engineering. And this is the essential lesson for this particular module. And we didn't talk about it too much yesterday because the programs we wrote sort of worked um, well, sort of first pass. But in machine learning, um, it, it really helps to think about your problem and to understand what are the features that are most relevant. And while we could say, yeah, you can just train unknown gene sequence data, it, it will sort of um, figure it out. With a simple neural net, it, it can't. Now, with more complicated neural nets, deep neural nets, and transformer architectures used in large language models, you could just feed it uh, examples of genes and uh, base calls, whether they're genes or not. And it would figure it out. It would understand the context. It wouldn't make this silly error that we're seeing, which is flipping N's and C's back and forth. Because what's happened is that we don't have context in our neural net model. So what we realized that to, to make this more efficient and more accurate, we have to include features. So the first one was, you know, don't just have the standard start and stop codons. There are within E. coli, um, three different types of start or possibly four. Uh, so we need to include alternate start codons. The other thing that we didn't include that's well known in genome um, circles is that there's a codon frequency preferences. So not every codon is used equally um, in terms of what's typical of a gene. Uh, the non-coding regions typically have a, a different codon frequency, and that's fairly characteristic. Another thing that people have known for a long time is that rather than just looking at triples like codons, if you look at um, two codon equivalents or a hexamer, um, you can get quite a bit more information. And it also turns out that within genes and within promoters and within terminators, um, there's very characteristic um, hexamer characteristics. And likewise, because we had just sort of said, this is coding and non-coding, by not including the information about promoters and the information about terminators, which define the beginning and ends of genes, we're ignoring stuff. So it's like you know trying to write a program that doesn't recognize periods or commas or spaces, and you're trying to identify words in a sentence. So if you don't have periods, commas, or, or if those aren't used, then you're, you're gonna sort of just merge all the characters and you're not gonna be able to identify words. So what we're trying to include is elements of genetic punctuation in this model. Um, and if you wanna think about this, you know, Pribno box, Shine Delgarno sequences, those are sort of, you know, paragraph indentations that allow you to identify you know, paragraph to paragraph. So what we're trying to do is, as, a, as an analogy to, um, you know, writing a program that can read um, text in a, in a page, or rather than just simply saying, can you identify characters, which is what the artificial neural net was doing, it was saying, can you identify spaces between words, periods, commas, beginning and end of paragraphs, and if you had that additional feature information, then you could probably parse through um, you know, a page more correctly, more completely. So those are the features that we're adding. So like, this is called feature engineering, and it's a vital part of most machine learning. So this is, uh, maybe I'll stop here. Does everyone understand what we're trying to do here? And that that this, this is adding features beyond just simply the sequence. Any thumbs up or have, have I lost everyone? Makes sense to me. And I gave a thumbs up. All right, at least we've got one person online. <laughs> um, all right, so I'll, I'll carry on. Um, so this, as I said, are the, uh, alternate start codons, so ATG is one that everyone knows, but GTG and TTG are well known. They can alternately code for valine or leucine. There's also a much rarer group of codons where 
even ATG um, is it not exclusively methionine. Um, you can get CTG, which I don't have what it translates to. Maybe it's an arginine codon or something. But that can also be methionine in these class two sets. And then you have other ones like ATT, ATA, that can be code for alternate codons. So we can include this, and we need to, in order to be able to get most of the codons in, in E. coli and most other prokaryotic systems. This is also something that is important, which is the minus 10, minus 35 sites. So there's the TATA box, uh, which is part of the RNA polymerase promoter region. Um, and there's this TTGAC also uh, in there. And these are about 100 bases uh, in front of usually the, the location of the, the, of the gene. Some of them can be a little further uh, ahead. Some can be a little closer. So this is, as I say, like it's a paragraph indentation that tells you, okay, there's about to be a paragraph. So if we recognize this site, this will help uh, make things a little more, co more coherent for identifying the genes. So this is called the Pribno box. There's another segment, which is once the transcript is released, this is the messenger RNA, there invariably is a, a sequence, kind of looks like AGG, AGG, um, which is where the ribosome binds. So this is another signal that we can look for to say, if I see the, um, the Pribno box and if I see the shine delgarno sequence, um, you know, in the first 100 bases or so, then there must be a gene here. And so this is information that's well known in, in genome studies. And this is how people wrote programs to help identify genes. Um, so we'll include that. Likewise, there are um, certain stem loop um, structures that you find them at the end of bacterial genes. And again, this has been known since the, probably the 1970s or 80s. And this is the hairpin loop um, that allows or forces the um, ribosome to fall off after it's read through the gene. So it doesn't do any sort of read throughs. And so these are termination uh, loops or stem loops. Again, you can find or locate these. And this has been another signal like a end of paragraph or line space or carriage return um, that's essential for finding genes in a genome. So as I said, what we're really focusing on is feature extraction. And it's trying to add knowledge that has been accumulated over the years. Um, and feature extraction is, is vital to machine learning. So the idea of just simply, if I give some sequence and some examples, this will give me you know, enough to solve it. More often than not, that's not enough. And as I said, having additional biological knowledge chemical knowledge, physical knowledge, and implementing that and those sets of features is important. It's the same sort of thing like we're trying to predict survivors, um, you know, age, sex, family size were important. Zodiac sign, birth date um, really didn't have any information. So feature extraction, can be done in a variety of ways. As I say, it can be done through your knowledge. Um, and this is why it's important for people with biological knowledge to do machine learning in biology. Um, or if you're a machine learning specialist, it's important to acquire knowledge in your domain. Um, so we can do um, feature selection automatically. We can do it semi-automatically, or we can do it manually. Um, what's more is it can recode some of the data that we're putting in to our um, data set rather than just simply sequences as we did with our raw data. We can convert the sequence data into feature uh, sets. So the, the gene sequences that we were originally describing, um, we can change those around to being just simply feature values. So we're kind of changing the one hot encoding that we did for just sequence data to more, more, I guess, equivalent to embedding. Uh, we're putting in um, more context information into the sequence data. So 
It's no longer letters, it's collections of features about letters. So we talked about the ones we wanted to include, and this is the codon frequency usage. So there's a difference between codon usage in coding and non-coding DNA. That's been well known for more than 50 years. Um, and so this is an example of the codons. So let's look at arginine where there's six codons. AGA, AGG, never used in uh, coding sequences, but CGC and CGU, highly used. In terms of stock codons, um, UAG, almost never used, but UAA and UGA are frequently used. Um, so, you know, this is information. This is really useful information, and it's, it's sort of universal across prokaryotes. So this is information that we can use. Um, so that codon um, usage is essentially allows us to look at, you know, what's the frequency of A in the first codon, A in the second codon, A in the third codon. And we can look at all these codons, in the case of what's the frequency of A in the first codon, it's you know, 16 out of 66 or 24%. Uh, we can look at the next one is what's the frequency of C in the first codon and all the way down. So if you do a little bit of math in your head, you'll see that essentially there's gonna be 12 cases where we can estimate what's the frequency of codons or bases in codons. So it's codon base usage frequency table. And so that's the vector that we can generate um, from, in this case, known genes and known non-genes. Um, so codon base usage is, is not something that we invented. It, it's been used for a long time. And in fact, people um, have replaced uh, codon usage in terms of uh, an entropy element. So remember, we learned about Shannon entropy, and it was um, uh, frequency of pi log base 2 times uh, pi. Here, we're just converting pi to fi, or fj. And so we can calculate the entire entropy for the set of 12. And remember, we did entropy calculations for sets of 2 and 4 and 6. So with 12, we get an entropy set, an entropy value of 2.18. So you can replace that first element of the 0.24 um, with the entropy of the entire thing, which is now converted from 0.24 to 0.12. So this is a, a, a trick that was found to really help with um, assessing codon usage and base usage. Um, I have no real idea why it was essential, but this is what people had identified as being critical. And so we did this. Um, so that was one set of features. So it's the codon usage that we've inferred by analyzing the genome. Um, and this is with the training data set. Um, we can also analyze the training data set in terms of hexamer usage. So hexamers, it's not just three, it's six. And this has been known, again, from almost 40 years. There's a lot of information in hexamers. And that the hexamer um, frequency or hexamer usage differs between promoters, terminators, and ORF and non-ORF. And so we can calculate the hexamer frequency, so ATTAGC. Um, this is where we're um, using log scores rather than uh, just total frequencies. Um, but it's, it's different between promoters and terminators. The lower the score, um, the, the worse it is, the higher the score, the better. So we can see that it's not used in promoters, not in terminators, but it's used in ORFs. Whereas TAAAA is used in both promoters and terminators, but not in ORFs. Um, so we can do this for the 4,096 different hexamers, and we can extract them from the, the training set. Uh, we can calculate um, the, the, those 
sums, and then we can calculate the logs. And so now we can generate a feature set for hexamer uh, usage. Um, the other thing that we can do beyond the hexamer frequency and the codon usage and co a base usage is to look for uh, what's called a position specific scoring matrix to identify a minus 35 and minus 10 box as well as the uh, in the promoter regions. And what we ended up doing was we created five different position specific scoring matrices for um, the promoter regions uh, that were either 15, 16, 17, 18, or 19 bases away from the um, start codon. And so that's a set, and this is, uh, we score the promoter at all those promotions, at promoter regions at every location through the training set. Um, again, we convert the scores to a log, which is commonly done in um, position-specific scoring matrices. Um, and generally, the lower the score, the better for a possum. So it's like golf. Uh, the lower the score you get, um, the better game you've had. So if we're sliding this, this possum across in terms of scoring you know, something that's 17 bases away, 18 bases away, or 19 bases away, we see that 18 bases away gives us a, a lower score, which indicates that this is probably a, um, a real um, promoter region. So you scan along uh, with your different possums. And here's we're looking at the location, base 90, at base 65, base 58. And we're looking essentially to try and find the, the best promoter region using any one of the five different possum scores. And so we find one at 4.97, that's our lowest score, using a possum box 18, and it's located at base 58 in front of the um, um, start codon. So that was uh, the Pribno box. There's also the Shine Del Garno. This is the one that finds the um, uh, ribosome binding site. And we're looking just for this AGG, AGG sequence. And it's about um, anywhere from three to 15 bases in front of the start codon. And so it's just using a simple scoring matrix and uh, it produces a um, typically should if it's log, it would be the lowest score wins. So what we've done, as I said, is simply converting our um, genome um, and genome information from just A, C, T, and G. We're converting um, that sequence data into codon usage features, so there's 12 of them. Hexamer scoring features, there's three of them. Pribno box features, there's 10 of them. And the Shine Del Garno features, which are seven. So um, it's 32 inputs instead of, uh, you know, this um, 17 by four um, sequence input. And um, it's something that we, you know, scan along the sequence, but we're now working in feature space rather than sequence space, if you want. And this would give us a much better readout, as it turns out, for predicting coding, non-coding regions. So, as I say, we converted um, the data to features rather than just raw sequence but we can still use this feature set as a way of searching for genes within DNA. So instead of um, gene searching, this is now gene prediction. So we're writing a program called Gene Prediction Artificial Neural Net. So we can do exactly as we've done before, uh, which is to take the um, Python code um, open up GPAN as we usually do in Google Colab. 
And this is the algorithm that we would write, and this is the algorithm that's been written for you. So we're going to read our data. We're going to import the gene position and the forward and reverse complement FASTA sequence. We're going to verify the data as we've always done before. We're going to create our codon set uh, and have our start and stop set, so we're identifying start and stop codons. Uh, we're going to call our OR function that we did before, which has a minimum length of 40 bases. We're pairing the start and stop codons to define them just as we did before. We're identifying the start and stop codons up to three stop codons in the same reading frame as we did before. Then separately, which is new, is now we're determining the codon usage frequency and the entropy parameter for the predicted ORFs. We're then creating hexamer counting functions um, to run it both on the coding and the non-coding data. And then we're creating the hexamer scoring function uh, and running it on the coding and the non-coding data. So the first set is that we're, we're you know, identifying um, all possible ORFs along with many, many false positives. And they're running this set of cleanup um, to uh, fix the ORF finder. And then, so after doing the hexamer and codon usage sheet stuff, we're then going to be running our possum scoring functions uh, on the promoter sequence. Then we're running the shine delgarno scoring function. Um, and then we're taking um, the uh, Pribno box. So that was the Pribno and shine delgarno and then using those inputs with our ANN and cleaning up the ORF finder that was for the first half of the algorithm. So we've created a list in the first half of the algorithm of all of our ORFs, which includes lots of false positives. And then we're cleaning up the ORFs with this feature um, finder, which analyzes each of the ORFs and basically says, this is an ORF, this is not. So you can think of it as a filtering step, but it's done using an ANN. So is everyone clear on, on that concept? So it's sort of a two-step program, one that uses conventional programming to find ORFs and a second neural net to filter out and identify the correct ORFs and get rid of the bad ORFs. OK, um, so for writing the program, we'll include NumPy and Pandas. And then we have Seaborn and Matplotlib for some data visualization, which you guys can do. Um, just as before, we've, we've imported the gene position data. So this is on our, on our training set. Um, we identify the reverse forward complement data as we've done before, same code, you guys have seen this. Uh, we're using um, these three extra stop or the standard stop codons. Um, and as before with the, the general or finder, we're looking at um, you know, frames and positions, uh, if it's a start codon, add it to start list, if it's stop codon, add it to stop list. So this is again, the same code that we did in the original or finder. Um, making sure that, the, that these stop codons are valid, that they're in the same frame. Again, same software that we did before, same coding that we did before. We have the minimum length uh, of 40, same code as the OR finder before. Um, and then, as I said, the, using the, the first three stop codons because of potential read through. So this is all the stuff, or at least that first half of the program is what was, was done before. It's this latter half, which is the more relevant one. So to calculate the codon usage uh, frequency, uh, we're doing exactly as, as I described in the other slide, but this is as it shows in, in the code. Um, so we have to have a, a ORF as a sequence of codons. So each of the ORFs that's identified, whether it's real or not, um, is analyzed this way, and each of them has their um, nucleotide occurrences in each of the frames counted. And then we create that 12 um, unit vector of frequencies, 
and then we have to replace the first element of the entropy. So this is done for each ORF. Um, and the, this is the math that we talked about in terms of calculating H uh, or entropy. And um, again, it's just description in code what we were describing before. So that's the code on frequency. And then if we shift now to the hexamer um, counting, um, this is where we're looking at the different hexamers. We have to do this in both the um, coding and non-coding hexamer data. We're doing it for the ORFs. We're looking at promoter and terminator regions um, that are surrounding the ORFs. Um, and so um, this is creating these three hexamer count sets for these, our features. So um, it's given a score based on its occurrence. So this is fairly dense coding, um, but we're looking for total number of hexamers in each of these regions, um, looking at whether this is a hexamer that's corresponding to coding, non-coding, or promoter. Um, so that generates the three features on hexamers, uh, coding, non-coding, and promoter. And then the possum scoring, um, this is where we're looking at the minus 35, minus 10 box. Um, it's the Privno sequence. And if you recall, we're looking at um, boxes at 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. And so we scan through those regions uh, around um, um, the first 100 bases in front of each projected or identified ORF. Um, so then we have a scoring function that then takes those promoter sequences as input. Um, let's say it's the first 100 or so bases um, associated with each ORF. And we like to see if we find those, and we like to see which one has the highest um, or best possum scoring. So with possums, it's generally the low score that wins. And then there's the, the shine del garno which is the ribosome binding site. Um, so again, we're looking at hexamers and we're giving um, an assessment of how close they are and we're looking over a, a region um, for this. And it's sort of like, again, the hexamer analysis. So I'll just go back. We did Shine del Garno, we did Pribno, we did hexamer, and we did codon frequency. And so those are the 32 features that are fed into uh, the neural net. So with this one, the architecture is um, 32 inputs, a hidden layer of five units, and then the output um, for the um, ORFs. Is it, is it a coding ORF or is it non-coding? Is it a true ORF or is it not a true ORF? So the program uh, that covers this, both the ORF finder, and then if you want to call it the ORF filter that uses the 32 features, is almost a thousand lines. So this is not a trivial program to write. Um, and because it's so long, it takes a while to run, and it's calculating a lot of data. Um, and this is part of the training set. Um, and then if you wanted to run it on a new genome or a new of DNA, um, it takes about 75 seconds. Um, so when you've written the program like this, as I said, it, it, it's an OR finder with an OR filter, with the OR filter using the, the neural net, um, you can then test it. So if you recall the original naive OR finder, um, did a pretty good job of identifying real genes. Um, so it was about 91% correct, or I think 42 out of the 4,400, 4,200. Um, but it, it had millions of false positives. So 1.6 million genes that were overpredicted. And what the point of this artificial neural net was to see if we could clean those up. Can we get rid of the 1.6 million and, and bring it down to a number of genes, maybe around 4,300 or 4,400. So we want this near zero, this near zero. We want this around um, 
uh, 0.99 and this around 0.99. So the other thing you recall is we wrote a, a naive neural net where uh, it tried to read through uh, or try to be an or finder uh, in a naive way. And instead of getting 0.91, we got 0.4. Um, at least we got 0.73 instead of zero. We didn't get you know 1.00 here. We'd ideally want zero here. And we'd ideally want zero here. This one, in terms of uh, or finding, also would be considered a failure. So not so good. So when we improved it by having the original or finder and combining it with this filter function um, that used these 32 features built using the neural net approach, uh, we see a huge improvement. So instead of 0.91, we're up to 0.92. Instead of 1.0 or 0.9999, we're down to 0 0.09. Also, uh, we're down to 0 0.07. And instead of this number being also fairly um, low, this is now quite high. So we're getting essentially a diagonal that's closer to one and one and off diagonals that are closer to zero and zero. So this is the, the use of putting in features um, and coding for features to, in our case, clean up a, a naive prediction. Um, we, so this is just including the codone frequency statistics. So then when we use the hexamer frequency statistics, things got better. Um, and then when we use the possum promoter, um, again, things got better still. Um, I think um, there's a fourth version that we had that included a hidden Markov model to help with sort of cleaning things up. Um, and these numbers jumped up to sort of 0 0.95, 0 0.95, and these are closer to zero. Um, we're not going to go into hidden Markov models because it's too complicated and it'll take too much time for, for things. But I, I, again, I really wanted to emphasize um, what we've done here is that we've used a naive uh, codon finder, first thing that we coded for, and then we used features that we learned or could learn from a training set. Um, and these are features that were well known in gene prediction circles. And we use those features to filter out or clean up the initial prediction. So it's still a neural net, it's still analyzing the sequence data, but it's done in feature space rather than secret space. And the, the filtering um, led to a huge improvement. It, it cleaned up, it got rid of most of the false positives. Um, it improved the overall identification of the true positives. So this went from 0.91 to 0.93. And then this, which was nearly zero, went to 0.92. This, which was 0.9999, went to 0 0.08. We could have, and as I said, used many more uh, statistics to help filter things. Um, we didn't. Um, this is where, again, people can use additional feature information if they want. But it also highlights one of the challenges with artificial neural nets. And um, I guess I could say that the early neural nets uh, versus the deep neural nets. Um, the neural nets um, with one or two hidden layers just simply aren't powerful enough to pick up context. And the more advanced deep neural nets or transformer models do pick up context. And so it would be much easier these days, or at least since 2023, to write um, a gene, gene or genome finder um, using um, a large language model. And it would do much better than what we're getting here. Uh, we'll talk about large language models later in, in today's lectures, but this is, as I say, instead of highlighting the key points about using features instead of, in some cases, sequence, and also highlighting some of the limitations of what neural nets can do. So this is a program written in pure Python. It predicts 
prokaryotic gene locations. We've trained it on E. coli genome data, um, but it should be able to do just as well on any other um, prokaryotic system. Um, as I mentioned before, if we tried to do the same thing for eukaryotes, it would be an all day lecture in lab, uh, much more complicated. Um, what we wanna do is now that you guys have this code for gene finding, um, we'll run it on a few examples. And so the, the lab will probably run for the next 20, 25 minutes. Um, likewise, if you have a preference to work with R, we do have um, R code. But the point um, is that the R code is much, much, much slower. And this is a characteristic of, of R as the program gets progressively more complicated. Um, R gets progressively and much rapidly slower than Python. So that's something to be aware of. 